Buenos días. Buenas tardes. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, welcome to our 19th uh, participatory group workshop, um, which is a, uh, an agreement subscribed between the um, Madrid City Council and the Distance University, UNED. I'm Professor Laura, Laura Tamayo. And I am the coordinator, together with the, uh, the technical part, together with uh, Susana and Antonio, the, the coordinators. Also, we have Luis Rodriguez Vega, Luis Rodriguez, and Cristina Garcia Cordon. And we have many more guests that will come and will comment on uh, this. Uh, what are we going to speak about? We have very special, two very special uh, guests, Miguel Coito and the Buenos Aires uh, City Council, which is a classical uh, participant in our uh, experts um, workshop, workshops. And they come with renewed energies uh, to tell us uh, what we are doing. Um, what are we going to speak about uh, in our workshops, uh, in our experts workshop? There are many uh, local entities, municipalities, regions, etc., uh, civil society that are doing very interesting things, uh, but they don't uh, know how to um communicate this or to hook uh, the citizenship so that um so that uh, the citizenship enters into the world of participation and this is why we're having two speakers today we have miguel coto and we will know more about him he's a publisher um and um, he has uh, started working in the world of architecture um, due to different reasons. And um, he's going to speak uh, what his method is. And as you know, we normally in these workshops, we speak about the strong points and the weak points or the pros and cons. We're not uh, here to sell a product, um, but we're here to learn, really. And then we will hear the uh, representative of the Buenos Aires City Council, which is uh, and who is going to tell us how they are working on uh, this participatory communication. So I just wanted to introduce you to the topic so as to give time to the uh, delayed participants to connect, to enter. And I would like to thank Miguel Couto Alvarez, uh, especially, very especially for being here because I was, uh, I failed to announce him the right dates in the beginning. And as you know, in our dynamics, um, Normally, this is, uh, these workshops are very relaxed, very informal. You can interact whenever you want uh, with the chat or by raising your hands. So the main thing is to have a nice time together and to learn a lot about participation. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. As I was rather introduced by Marta Lora, I come from the world of um, publish, publish, um, sorry, advertisement uh, communication. And my link with architecture comes through different um, sides or aspects. I always liked the uh, everything relating urban development and or urban planning, and I see that in terms of the most regulated part, what you need to comply with, I saw that this was a disaster. Public information in the wording of general plans 
uh, normally the law was obliging us or forcing us to uh, openly expose the document 45 days before, but when you came to the city council in question, uh, the document was on the table and you were uh, alone with that document and unless you were a technician, you did not understand the word. And I was saying, well, this is really bad for the citizen because the citizens are coming here and either they have money to hire a technician um, to be explained the document or they are going to live without any idea whatsoever what, uh, about what the document is saying. So, this is very important for city councils because you are providing a service to the city council that you were not providing before. And this is how I started being interested in, in this topic. And on the other hand, I think that the topic of uh, communication and participation is all communication, really, because participation is a communication process, even though it is uh, by be directional. I mean, you convey a message and you receive a response. And um, I realized little by little that communication and participation is practically the same with some nuances, yes, but mostly the same deep down, it is the same. And in 2013, I came with a, uh, a team. I presented myself to a tender in the Basque country, and we won the tender. We included uh, the topics or the concepts of participation and communication, and this has influenced, I think, in our winning the tender, especially because we were a wording team uh, not coming from the Basque country, or a drafting team, really, a writing team, and we, we won the tender. And this, uh, well, you have to think that the Basque country is a region, uh, a, a very, well, a slightly peculiar region in, in Spain. If you are not a Basque, in fact, that's a bad start. And this is how I started working uh, on the topic of participation and communication. As for the methodology that we applied back then, this was the methodology, the standard methodology that you could learn by reading and uh, by speaking with the sociologist that we were having. But little by little, we saw that the um, standard methodology worked sometimes, in some other places did, it did not work, and you, throughout the drafting of the general plans, you were changing your strategy, you were adapting to the needs. What we did see and learn in the Basque country was that intervention, well, this is my point of view, of course, eh? I, I just I'm going to share with you my own experience and what I've been learning and applying and modifying. I was saying that in the Basque country, we saw that the direct intervention of political representatives in the participatory processes is a terrible mistake. Why? Because a large part of the uh, people that go to these participatory processes are political representatives, not officially, but they are indeed linked or bound to a political party, either the one uh, that is governing the country or the one that is opposing the main party. So this process is linked to this political ideology and has in front another political representative and then it becomes a political debate. And the goal that you intend to have or to achieve with such a process, then it's not going to be achieved because you're the, the, all, all, the sub, all the targets such as um, collecting information or gathering information, the participation by citizens, everything, all that goes to uh, second um, place, let's say, and uh, then it becomes a political debate. And therefore, it is an error, it is a mistake. In the Basque country, they uh, 
were always, uh, all the political parties were there in all the processes that we called upon. And this became a failed participatory process because we were coming out of the process uh, in, a, in a worse situation as the initial situation. And then even the, the political leaders or the political representatives were even, um, even um, struggling or fighting really uh, against each other. So it was worse than before, even after the process. So this was a huge error, a huge mistake. And therefore, in the following uh, participatory actions, I tried to change this. For example, the image that you see here, the picture, is one of the participatory sessions that we organized. This took place in Gijón, in the area of Asturias, in the region of Asturias, where in the drafting of uh, land use planning, that had been cancelled, that had provoked a terrible social movement in the rural areas. The green um, strikes were organized. And the, um, well, everybody was against this um, land use planning. So we had to review the recently cancelled plan to review it. And therefore, we had to face this mistrust uh, by the rural world because they had been doing these green marches and demonstrations, not strikes, um, demonstrations rather. So the, um, the mayor, a woman, she was you can see here uh, the woman who represents um, the urban councillor. Um, and she was selling the idea that this would be the best land use planning in Spain. The drafting or writing team was uh, made up by um, TPA, and there were two chief. Um, architect, one who was more focused on participation and the other one, precisely the manager, who was against participation. And the, there were urban planners, there were architects, and they believed that uh, they were the sole heads there, that nobody would have a say against what they wanted or they intended to do. So everything started very well, a very intense participatory um, process on the ground. We were able to uh, tame the wild beasts, let's say, those green marches. And, um, well, participation is very much linked to communication um, because in, it is essential that people place their trust on, upon you, that they believe what you say, and to believe what you say, they need to trust you. And in terms of participation, well, this happens in communication, and in terms of participation, it's exactly the same. If the citizen does not believe you are a, a reliable person, then they won't trust you, they won't feel they want to follow you. So we... Uh, achieved a lot of things. We uh, turned the previous land use planning around and you have to think that Gijón is a leftist uh, region and there was that in that legislature um, the political party in power was the right party. So the rural world, after this process, saw that the attitude of this new corporation was absolutely different to the previous um, government that had made them go on these green marches. And then the government and the citizens um, changed their minds totally, so the political party won again. So in the second term, when the, uh, the mayoress said that, that, that the mayoress was saying that she wanted a participatory plan, what well, she forgot about it. And so everything that we had found a consensus upon with a lot of effort, with many meetings, with a lot of patience uh, by all 
parts or all stakeholders, well, it did it did never reach a good end because of this. So in the end, as we saw, uh, as we read the document and we we realized that this was not what we had agreed with the citizens. And uh, we were thinking, oh, this must, this cannot be like that. And then um, there was a kind of a conflict with uh, the a confrontation um, with the city council. And there was a moment where we were expelled. As I normally say, I. I used to say, I want to go back to Gijón and go to the rural world without fearing being hit with a with a bat or with a stick. Because, of course, many of the things that we were committed upon that were reflected in the document were not followed, not being followed. And therefore, I did not want to go back to Gijón with this idea. I mean, I did not want to continue with this process because it was totally against my intention or my initial ideas. Therefore, in the end, we have made more plans. We have been adapting the plans. I don't know how much time I have left because if you leave me speak, um, we, will, we will reach the evening even in Argentina. So, um, by way of conclusion of all the participatory processes, uh, I'm talking about the processes that are linked to urban development, but then I have also done things that are not related to urban development. But in terms of urban development, and um, in terms of everything really, urban planning, the trend, well, even though all the people you see on the picture, on the photograph, are technicians, are architects, the idea of urban planning is to include architects that do know uh, what you're talking about, but the idea is to also to include, to make the language accessible for those that are not technicians, so that they will, despite not being architects, they will understand what you say. I don't know why, maybe it's because of the ego or because of the way we are taught. The language uh, used by architects when they address normal citizens that are not architects, they, the architects still use this uh, technolo technology or this architectural jargon that the general citizens, the normal citizens do not understand and architects have this bad habit to use this language, this jargon. Of course, that's very valid, valid when they um, speak with their peers, but not when they speak to citizens, normal citizens that are not um, architects. Of course, I'm not an architect myself, and we tend to use a different type of language, maybe a more colloquial one. And this is, I think, the main reason why we are closer to the citizens, so that the citizens will believe what we convey, what the information we, we convey. I love public information. I, this is, I think this is um, a very rewarding type of topic because you help people uh, to understand what they intend to do with their real estate or with their properties. Because in um, public information, whenever they are not technical architects, uh, the main concern by everybody is, what about my property? And sometimes you need to tell citizens things that they don't want to listen to, to they don't want to hear, sorry. Uh, but it is very, very important. It is a great achievement to be able to tell them negative things without getting them angry with a lot of empathy so that the citizens will understand why is this. Because I think one of the main goals of public information beyond the mere fact of explaining what is going to be done is to um, try to get a less number of claims 
um, because, uh, well, I don't know if the people that are um, gathered here today are technicians. Well, there, there, there are a lot of people here gathered, technicians and non-technicians. Well, you must understand that answering those claims and dealing with those claims is really a nightmare. And you really need to think about those claims very well um, because your plan can get rejected due to these claims. And therefore, you need to avoid those claims in as much as possible. And um, I'm going to finish with the urban planning uh, topic here. But I want to, to add uh, to say that in these uh, years, uh, the process has led us to selecting the stakeholders, the groups of interest very well, to try and to filter out uh, political groups in as much as possible, again, because it's very difficult to achieve this 100%, but you can at least avoid the 100% uh, politicization or politicization of the people coming to the meetings. Um, so we have all types of groups, selected groups that are small, that are, belong to many different disciplines. Uh, we try not to go for the huge participatory processes um, because it leads to nothing. And a very important topic or a very important point is to include participatory processes before going to the communication processes. You need to include people. Um, these opinions need to be based on something and in the end, otherwise in the end you are getting information or feedback that is going to be useless to you because if the people, if the citizens do not have any idea what you're talking about and they don't know what you're intending to do, when this um, uh, informative process would serve no purpose. I mean, your information process and your participation process needs to be thorough. It needs to be well planned. You need to really convey information when you um, speak with these people. Okay, so one question in this process where you have been uh, underlying those phases, uh, trust, creation, empathy, and reduction of conflict, because in the end, we all this is aimed at reducing uh, conflict. I liked the, when you, I liked it when you mentioned these selected groups. The other day, um, we were uh, gathered behind closed doors, and one of the questions in that meeting was, how do you choose those people? How do you get to these people when you need some previous work? I mean, it is very different when, whether you are in your region or in your city, because not everybody, I'm talking about the whole of Spain, okay, because not in not all regions in Spain, people are the same. For example, we made a participatory process of inclusion of gender issues in a strategic plan in Soria. And before starting um, your work, uh, you need to research a lot. And sometimes it takes quite a lot of time to say what it is about. And uh, I think that at the end, it is, it is better to maybe waste a little bit of time before and try to do the best as possible. It's not going to be perfect, obviously, but just do your best because the results will be better, will be more fruitful. So, for example, in a participative process in Castilla-La Mancha, a German company called me uh, because they installed a photovoltaic plants of 800 hectares. So, so you can imagine how big it is. And they told me about it and they told me about the project. And at the beginning I was like, I, I'm not sure if I can do this because it's a very big, big project. 
that was a little bit against my principles, these 800 hectares of photovoltaic plants. So that was a ver the first conversation, which was uh, on the phone. So I talked to these German people and we started talking. And... Uh, I don't know it is because they are really used to fighting against the world opposition because they've got plants everywhere in the world. So they've been fighting with ecologic group, green groups, etc. So I see that the attitude of these Germans against the dimension of these photovoltaic plants was... Uh, a little bit different. So it wasn't like, I'm just going to be come here, put the plants, and, and that's it. No, it was different. Because a topic like this one, it's, it's either a win-win or, or there's nothing to be done. Because if there is only one part winning, then the other part will, have, will want nothing to do with it. So if we want one thing to work out, at least we both parts must have the feeling that, that it is going to be beneficial for both parts. It's going to be a win-win. So they got to Castilla-La Mancha, Toledo, and they saw that there was a social movement uh, against them, and it was a very big social movement. And uh, and I thought, well, I'm not even surprised. So I started investigating, uh, but because I don't do anything about participation, I went to La Serra in this place, and I talked to the citizens, and we start to see and that there's some kind of informative manipulation that is actually really big, and is coming from a small group. So the Germans. Uh, didn't really bother about to tell us about it because they were just uh, um, doing the the capture land process. So, so then he had seen that there was this. Uh, I'm going to call it semi-ecological group because they were not really from these ecological groups. They were working in their own interests. But well, there was this group that uh, that built uh, what we call uh, like a cemetery for the ashes. So they created that in this place. And then there was uh, our wine um, land. So so there was a winery working there. And they wanted this. Well, let me go back because the cemetery didn't like it because it was very high. And from there, they will see the uh, photovoltaic plants. Then the winery that was against them as well because they had their uh, vineyards there and they said that this was not going to work if they had this and then the other that it was a protected soil it had it didn't have uh, any um happening so to to discover all of that 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 took a very uh, long time. But that's what I was doing. I was just researching, investigating, trying to understand why, beyond uh, the uh, arguments that say that it is polluting, why were people opposing to this? And to get this information, I got this information, and then we had the participative process to express different points of views. It was completely different. But that's what makes it easier, because the moment you call an assembly and then the people from the condominium come and they um, say they're very angry, then I'm saying, OK, um, why are you saying that it is polluting? Because you're the ones who are working on it, because you are putting uh, the waste in these lands. So give me another argument, because that's not real, that's not true. So this information was vital to to kind of break down that uh, fake information and i'm telling you about all of this because of this uh, previous process of uh, finding out which groups can be the most appropriate ones uh, the ones that are not influenced by an opposing group 
because what they want to do is then kind of fight with the government and then and do it for another association, etc. So this is why I'm saying this is crucial. Um, I can tell you more about it, or maybe not. Um, we loved your presentation because the, the dynamic of these cases, it's, uh, you, you opened lots of uh, different fields for us to see. Now we're going to give the floor to Buenos Aires and then we can have a conversation. Um, sorry, Miguel, if you wanted to say something else? It's all good? Okay, fantastic. Right, um, I've got here many questions written down because I really loved your presentation. The language that you use is because I'm kind of seeing you in this participative process. I see you there. Okay, now let's move on to Buenos Aires. Welcome back because it's been one of our pillars there in the dynamic, uh, dynamic group. And they've been very proactive and are the avant-garde of the participation processes. And obviously, they're Argentinian, so they're great at communication uh, on this participation. So they're going to tell us about their experience, and then we will have our shared debate. So Buenos Aires, you can introduce yourselves if you'd like. Then go on. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? My name is Celeste Peña. I'm Director of uh, Citizen Participation in the new government of Buenos Aires City. Uh, we, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Buenos Aires City, the goal that we have as uh, directors, because we want to increase the participation. When we started in the project, we started with the strategy to see what we want to communicate to whom and the tools that we will use to get to the audience. But it's related to what Miguel was speaking about, this communication strategy, who is going to be told about it? Who's the objective? Who's the, our audience? Who's our audience? Because otherwise it's very difficult to create this empathy um, and for the people to understand where we're going to. Why are we doing this and what for? At this in Buenos Aires. It's because we want to listen to our neighbours. We want to understand what's going on. We want to understand what's happening in Buenos Aires because here the neighbours are in their square meter. That's what we call it. So. We need to know that and we want to open the government of Buenos Aires. We want them to know what's going to happen, but also what, where we're aiming. We want to innovate in public policies. What's the path that we're following? Manage conflicts to understand what's happening. Every policy leads to a conflict because the neighbors change, the city grows. So it's more and more complex to manage this type of conflict and they have different needs. And that's what we want to cover. We also share this idea of the virtuous circle through citizen participation. And that's again what Miguel was saying, to trust your government to have efficient public policies to generate this, to raise this awareness. So the people living there can support us, they will support us, they will trust us to have this participative government that has a new way of ruling, thinking about all the processes. This contributes not only to the trust, as Miguel was saying, and the credibility of uh, the citizens, because if we're not credible, if we're not going to be believed, if people don't trust us, then everything that we will do, well, there's going to be lots of people who will be against us anyway. In Buenos Aires, we've got lots of changes that we see 
for example, we've got all um, underground crossings. Um, and we need to think about what's the technical part, our um, architectonic part. What can we tell our neighbours to explain where we're going to and what's going to improve? So for this, communication must be clear and it needs to be easy to understand. To understand. Um, so we're speaking about this participation, about what's going to happen in that square metre. OK, there will be some work done, but how can I participate? So maybe there is going to be a, um, a square is going to be built for all the neighbours there. There's going to be more shopping centres. So what's going to be added? How is your life going to improve with all these things? So we need some work to be done. And also see the positive side of it. Because there will be some initiatives where not everybody agrees. But then uh, the other uh, side of uh, the coin is that this is going to be improved, so that we can negotiate uh, this modification so everyone's happy about their square metre. And all of that leads to trust. To get to the transformation. El vínculo, el círculo virtuoso es muy importante. The virtuous circle is very important. Uh, and when we speak about uh, closeness, uh, communication, uh, citizen participation, all of this is very important. In Buenos Aires, we have three million of uh, uh, inhabitants that work there every day. And it's 200 kilometers. So it, we need to have a strategic plan. We need to know who we're talking to, where we're going to, and what we want to communicate. All of this is used through a concept. And uh, Angie, who works with me, she's a communication manager within the general direction of what we call cercanía, which is a closeness, so we're near. So this is very important because we need to create that trust. Here in Buenos Aires, we also have the opposition part, of course. And when we have this type of meetings, what we want to say is that we are political parties, but uh, we, the, the square meter is, uh, it belongs to the person who lives there, not to us. So that's why we want to reach some consensus. So I follow with uh, my, what my colleague was saying about the uh, proposal. As she was saying, we work, uh, we've been working for some years now in studying and in understanding who's the audience, who's interested about the different activities that we have as a direction. And we want to use that effective communication for the projects to be carried out because we want them to participate. And um, today is actually the day of what we call the participative neighbor. And we celebrate this uh, on the 11th of June. And that's what they're doing as activities to commemorate this day. So it's a, it's a great occasion to celebrate this with you today as well, when we celebrate this day. We also do some activities, invite people to the Colón Theatre. Uh, if you have been in Buenos Aires, the Colón Theatre is something that's unique in Buenos Aires. And we invite the, our, the neighbours to come to get to know the different rooms of this theatre. So if you ever have the opportunity to come, I really, really recommend it because it's beautiful and we can show you all the activities that we've been sharing during this uh, uh, first six months of the year and show you some videos, etc. I just wanted to mention this. I'm sorry for going a little bit out of topic. Now, going back to it, 
eh, nosotros um, speaking about uh, well when we have participative processes we try to put them in different um, in different parts so the the neighbor can be part of the three of them when we say the works that is going to be done as the first part and then the second part is when the works get started and the third one is when we inaugurate them so we divide these three activities in activities that are actually attractive for the different type of public that we may reach and obviously ranging from all ages because there are different devices that's what we call them in buenos aires is devices for the citizens uh, uh, so they can find it attractive and be part of these uh, processes. Uh, here I have a kind of panel that, uh, uh, well, we call them excuses of how we can communicate about our project of citizen participation. And as I was saying, to, to encourage people to be part of it and because we want to reach to all those segments uh, we want to understand what the audience is interested in. So it's like uh, understanding the area in which we will be working. It can be an underground crossing, as we were saying. If that's interesting for the for the citizens, what they think about the situation that we're stating, and this is communicated through different uh, tools of communication. Other thing can be our diagnosis meeting. This is wider. This is a wider call to that specific place. For example, uh, geolocalize the communication. Please do stop me if there's something that you don't understand. Uh, because sometimes I know we use different words. And so please do stop me if there's anything you need. Right. So this diagnosis meetings to work. Uh, uh, collaboratively with uh, neighbors who are part of this process uh, and sometimes a third instance to communicate uh, we ha we call it a coffee with the specialists because it is great that the technic uh, technicians who are part of these processes are also architects or engineers or the roles whatever role they may have but to have uh, these people to tell the neighbors about what's going to happen so it can be better understood. In the fourth place, an informative meeting. If we have already a process, as we have said, uh, the opinion diagnosis meeting, the coffee with the specialist. So now we have this informative meeting because we want to analyze what's uh, coming up, what we get from the neighbors, what's interesting for them, so we can be part of this process and have this informative meeting and tell them, tell all the citizens how we're going to carry out this process, this project. Right, with all of this, we've presented the projects, uh, bearing in mind uh, the neighbours in these four steps and telling them about these uh, processes. So finally, we get to the moment where the works are being done, actually. So we invite them because we want them to be part of it. But we're working, so we invite them to have a, a BA experience, Buenos Aires experience. So we invite the neighbors who are interested to visit the works, to see what we're doing. So how do we do this? So, well, we use some channels for the communication. The people sign up and, and then we invite them. So this is where we have these visits so they can see what's happening. And uh, in many cases, uh, we've got many opportunities. Uh, we have even some votes. If there's a process that's happening, so, for example, if it's a park and we want to name this park, then we invite uh, the neighbors to vote for the different names that they may think is right for the park. Next, we have uh, another part, and we call them fundamental meetings. These are neighbors' meetings when we speak about a specific topic, but it's not just for the meetings 
who are located in the area where we're in this process, but also to all the ones that are interested in the topic that we are working on. So we widen our audience so we can get to, to all the neighbors since the location of the neighborhood maybe didn't um, allow us to do it because what's, what's attractive is the topic. And finally, to close it, uh, then we have the inauguration event. We've gone through all the different parts, all the different stages to finally finalize the process and then we work together about the, uh, all the process, uh, this path, so they could be part of it because they actually are. So that gives that gives us also credibility and that uh, trust, uh, so we can do all the pro uh, participative process in the future. We work in different areas of the government. We're always uh, linked. And we're always in contact with them to understand uh, from the communication and from the implementation of these activities. We can accompany them, and then we understand. Uh, the, how we can have more experience, how we can communicate. We're also speaking about uh, in the relevance part, in the crucial meetings, we have also uh, some known people. They can be celebrities, they can be influencers, but it's people who allow us to get to more people so this project is uh, is well known these are some emblematic projects that we've been working on in the last few years with different devices as i was explaining before we had the meeting for diagnosis and uh, brainstorming this is from ba cluster and it was tackled in a project of urban transformation. It was eight uh, parts of participation and communication in which we highlighted how important it is what uh, uh, the neighbors were expecting from this and the different processes that we had, the diagnosis, co-creation meetings, uh, visits to the places, and how we could carry all of that out uh, in this VA Costa project. And this contained different activities to allow us to reach to a, the widest audience possible. And we wanted to be as harmonious as possible so everyone can be heard. Another participative process that was uh, very important. It was opinion plus informative meetings and consultation meetings with the new primary school. So here it, we tackled an education project where we researched about the curricular design of the primary school. We wanted to see segments of the uh, educative uh, community, the families, parents were interested about this education and how we can improve them. So we had 16 parts of participation and communication in which I know I'm repeating myself, but each and every single one of them, we're always trying to find different audience, different profiles of how we can get to all the citizens. Another one for the citizen participation with the Voluntary Census BA, we've got a project that is called BA Volunteers BA, in which we invite citizens to be part of it and to be part of the different activities. Many of them are in, a, in a more like an environmental activities. Uh, for example, also working with pets, volunteering with pets. And we saw more than 100 volunteers in these activities having this exclusive day. 
and we invite you to have this uh, punctual project to, for example, plant some trees, things like this that we've been doing in our city in different places. So, so you can all participate in this. Yes, and here we're working with volunteers and we will want to work with this trust process. So the volunteers are the people who want to help somehow. So we've got uh, some basis. So for, depending if, if it's something to do with pets, something to do with environment, etc. And for example, here was about cleaning, etc. Because we want to see that obligation that the government belongs to everyone and we cohabit and we want to take care of what we have and um, this accompanies us in this credibility and it is part of, of what we're doing so we can create what we were what we've been speaking about thank you Another example where we called and we communicated the uh, the votes. Uh, so here we have an environmental project uh, within the framework of an international event that is called C40. And here, as you can see, more than 1,600 people participated to carry out uh, this uh, environmental project. Here we have another case, another example. Visit, uh, visiting the works in the innovation park, that's a project uh, of urban transformation. So we showed that how we managed this with the experts, uh, experts that were very important uh, in this field to see how all of this was built and the park was uh, improved. So we had two instances of participation and communication. Another BA experience as a recycling center that we have in the city. And here, what is this green topic, environmental topic in Buenos Aires? And even at a general level, but that's very attractive for all the neighbors because, and this usually is very, is very participative and our calls are very effective. It, and finally, two more activities that are part of the participation processes. What, what my colleague was saying at the beginning of her um, of this uh, talk, we have a neighbors meeting to talk to them, to talk with all the neighbors, so they can talk about the different topics. They can raise the problems that they may have in their neighborhoods, so the civil servants can see them face to face and give them answers. Same with the crucial meetings, these relevance meetings. These uh, are uh, meetings that could be uh, virtual or on site. Uh, and we have the audience there and the topic that we want to talk about. But to see how we work in these meetings, this is more for um, younger audience. Uh, sometimes we use Instagram because uh, this is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, it is that we are working, we as a government uh, are working, but sometimes it's hard for us to get to the young audience uh, and understand uh, what makes them be happy, what uh, they enjoy. Sometimes we're a little bit left behind and we don't really understand it, but because the platforms are much faster than we are and we need to be up to date uh, all the time. So we need to understand how they work to get to, to this public that in our case in Buenos Aires uh, is younger. But all these activities, although they are projects, how do they come, how do we communicate them? What are the tools we use? Well, we currently have territory equipment. We call them territory agents or stakeholders, they are on the streets in all the 15 different districts. Well, 48 districts really, but um, we also have communes. And um, in 
some cases we have a territory agents that communicate um, and we have also we work also with SMEs, um, social um, short message systems, uh, web platforms, mailings and IVR. These are our seven tools that we use currently to be able to communicate different activities. Again, all our activities, um, and we don't use all these tools for all activities, of course, just uh, for a few of them. But if we want to encompass a younger audience, the tools will be normally social networks, or uh, mailing, um, sending emails, for example, which is more attractive for young people. Call centers or IVRs are not so attractive to young people. But we in the um, city government, well, our public coverage age is more than 50 years. And therefore, a call center or sending emails is what attracts and uh, attracts more this um, population. If, for example, there is a meeting among different um, neighbors 72 hours before, we send them emails, we send these neighbors emails asking them to call to come. And we uh, also uh, put the call center at the service or the IVR at the service of these uh, neighbors. And depending on the activity for the eight hours before the meeting, we go and visit the territory. We go and visit the district neighbors so as to capture their attention. We understand there is a lot of people passing by, by passers. And they don't live in that um, neighborhood, but we are giving them the opportunity to, uh, well, the, we are giving them the information or the message that the um, government of the uh, city of Buenos Aires is there and uh, can help them participate in any activity. But how do you have access to those email addresses? That was my question as well. That's I wanted to to ask this again uh, as well. I mean, well, we work with databases. We have uh, registrations for all these events. There are some registration forms, and it's a pity I did not bring any of these. But I'm telling you, <clears throat> we normally. Uh, in a territory, we capture the database. The most, the most important thing in the beginning is to um, have a, uh, as large as possible uh, database. We start asking for an email address for the number of phone number. Of course, it is more difficult for neighbors uh, in a house to provide you with this information, but we are capturing or collecting all these informations. And the moment we have these data, we uh, create a database and we uh, start understanding how this audience is moving, what are their interests, etc. I think I have interrupted someone, sorry. My question is, uh, well, I was going to say that in our case, our participation is uh, only limited to the Ciudad Madrid, which is a digital platform. And we had problems with the data privacy uh, or the GDPR law, because there are some people that register uh, in this platform and they need to check uh, every one of the interests they have and all the, every one of the permits or the um, yes, the permissions they give us to share data. We can only um, include those issues that appear in Plataforma Madrid. We even had a problem with well, some claims 
um, before the um, data protection, the Spanish Data Protection Agency, and I uh, am really envy of you because you have these um, databases. Well, it is true that every time we um, have uh, any 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 occasion, you know, uh, finding neighbors, for example, we ask them for the data and we invite them and in the place they ask them for the data. And once they are registered, they need to fulfill all the data as possible. And of course, we have the GDPR, we are GDPR compliant as well, but as this is specifically to regarding these topics, they uh, give us access and we can invite them to these activities. But of course, uh, we need to ask them for their permission, of course. And after a publication, for example, if there is any other um, issue, for example, any other topic that they want to have uh, access to, um, we can provide them access if they provide them uh, provide us their data. And we also have the, give them the possibility that if they don't want to be included uh, in that mailing list or they don't want to us to have their data anymore, they can of course unsubscribe. But in Argentina Tina, we uh, want to know, we want to be aware of what is happening in the city. This is very typical of Argentinians, or at least the Buenos Aires inhabitants. They are very active, very much aware and willing to know what is happening. So they give us their data freely whenever it is uh, to, for these purposes. Our average uh, is citizens uh, with uh, 45 years or more. And this is our goal to see how we can get them. And of course, uh, to try to capture them and capture their attention and their interest. Celeste, I have a question regarding this. Is there any distinction between the word neighbor? Because neighbor normally are uh, <clears throat> are the people that appear in the census. But um, what is the difference between the persons that appear in the census and the citizens? I mean, neighbors and citizens. How do you distinguish, for example, between these people living in the city and these people that are just working in the city, for example? Well, we in Buenos Aires have uh, something like 3 million inhabitants that uh, live there and 3 million of uh, people coming to the city to work. Obviously, neighbors are the ones that are uh, have their domicile or their home in Buenos Aires. Um, and we don't distinguish whether they are coming from the provinces just to work in Buenos Aires, but I'll try to answer you. Um, regardless of whether he or she is sleeping or not in the city, the changes will affect them if you are working in a at a bread um, furnace, for example, or you're making bread and you have to come to Buenos Aires in the morning every day and um, there are works on the road, for example, and less amount of people can come and buy your bread every day, you are going to be impacted by this and you want to know these changes, even if you don't sleep in Buenos Aires, um, you will have to make changes. You will have to maybe advertise somewhere else or or not come by by car. So you will have other you will you will want to know about these changes. 
and this will interest you. It happens to us that shops do not only belong to people living in Buenos Aires. Some people just come to work to Buenos Aires, it's true, but these uh, people are also interested in knowing what is happening in the city because it impacts them directly. And it impacts their businesses directly. And what we want is to inform everybody, especially in cities, this is very important because you live there, you work there, you have your children there, whichever the reason, to me, the worst thing that can happen to you as a citizen is the lack of information because you are living in any district, but you still live there, you sleep there or not, your children go to school there, things happen, and it's important to have some predictability and some information beforehand that will allow you to react if changes are happening. So within the database, uh, whether Yes, uh, we have the information whether this person is living in the city or not. But regardless of that, they will receive the information all the same. Your know, information is always open to everybody. Miguel wanted to take the floor and Luis as well, because in the chat we see several questions. Let's go to the debate part, please, uh, Miguel first, and then Miguel first. Can you take the floor? You are muted. Okay, thank you. Regarding what Celeste is saying, I think that the opinion of citizens is as equally important as a neighbor's opinion. Although it is true, I mean, citizens and neighbors are living in the city, but it is true that during the night, neighbors are suffering uh, all the noises of the night, for example, whereas um, people who are not sleeping in the city do not live these impacts or do not suffer from these impacts all the same. Uh, but still, I, I agree with you that uh, we should consider them both equally. Uh, another question is, um, Angeles is speaking about previous to the, uh, she's speaking about three different moments before the works, during the works and after the works. So um, there, it, the need of these works, is this, uh, have you found a consensus for this or do you normally um, make a participatory process on something that is imposed? Um, it would be important to know what the citizens think about the need uh, for these works or that other type of works um, so as to avoid uh, the uh, making it a mandatory for the citizens, like for example, tunneling or something. And I would like to ask also whether your participatory processes are binding or non-binding. And my question to all of you, do you think that participatory processes that we carry out are representative? You were speaking about a participatory process where 1,500 people participated. Well, that's great, but 1,500 out of how many? Because if you consider um, the population of Buenos Aires, which is 3 million people, do you think that 1,500 is representative? Do you think that 1,500 people can um, impose their will on 3 million people? This is my question. Yes, no, no, I understand your question regarding what you were asking, whether, if we, whether we impose the works on citizens. Some project of thought, are plans, yes, but they um, there is a diagnosis previously, and we want to understand what the citizenship thinks about those projects regarding this first diagnosis and regarding the information gathering. 
we can get different responses and how and we can see how the neighbors would respond um, had we carried out the works for example i'm going to interrupt you sorry if in this participatory process the citizens decide they don't want the works will you carry out the works this is my question depends on the cases if the city government the municipal government considers that this works is necessary because it may uh, put the citizens into risk we will do that yes but we try to find some consensus with the neighbors and that's why we organize these um, participatory meetings so that the so you're trying to legitimate your decision right because uh, well in many cases yes i agree that most of the times you have a political representative who has been chosen because otherwise they would just be a political citizen i remember speaking to the bilbao mayor and when the um, city council in bilbao decided to carry out the guggenheim museum that was a very delicate moment for bilbao because the unemployment rate was really skyrocketing it was a disaster, the situation of the city back then. But the mayor decided to uh, allow for the Guggenheim Museum to be built. Can you imagine Bilbao without the Guggenheim today? Well, he was chosen by the citizens to rule um, a city. I don't know if you in Argentina make uh, participatory pros, uh, budgets and uh, well in spain not anymore because in some cases a small part of the budget is oriented towards uh, making it participatory but if the citizens by absolute majority decide to do something that is against the ideological principles of the party that will not be done and therefore these decisions are not binding and in Spain, the main problem in the drop of uh, citizen participation in these processes is precisely due to the fact that they are not binding. The citizens say, why am I going to participate to wait my time if they are going to do whatever they want? And this is the reason why the citizens are not participating anymore or not so much as before, because they are tired of participating and for, for to no avail. Right? You understand? Yes, I agree with what you say. Of course, it happens to us, not everywhere. Sometimes you need to make the decision, and this is the most difficult part of the decision-making process, because not all neighbors will agree with uh, these uh, works, because every neighbor has a different interest or their interest. But then, most of the neighbors can choose or opt for something and you need to uh, work with the opinion of the most, uh, the majority, right? And most of them can um, have a say on what is happening, but the, it would be better if the participatory process is previous to the project, even though the uh, citizens' decision is against this project. You should gather the citizens and explain to them why this project is necessary, despite their decision of not wanting this project. Um, and uh, this would be much better than just uh, starting some works and then trying to legitimate that. I think we are mixing concepts here. On the one hand, we have political decisions. Um, and on the other hand, well, now that you mentioned the participatory budgets, there are processes where the participation is not binding in itself. I mean, with the general nature. Um, 
some of these uh, participatory processes are binding, so the local or regional governments uh, need to uh, follow those decisions that have been approved uh, throughout a very lengthy process, and at least in the case of Madrid, there are some causes where they are um, understood as non-feasible, etc. Yes, I know what uh, Madrid does, and I'm not going to argue. I'm not personalizing anything. No, but I'm saying this because of the representativity that you were saying. There are some assumptions where this lack of representativity, and I agree that this is deficient because it's always the same people who participate. In our case, despite all this, there is an increase in the participation. We haven't seen any drop in the participation, but at least this is the impression we're getting. We have more people registered, more people interested and involved and committed. But it is true that in the case of participatory processes, we have cases where the citizens have decided in a very small amount or small, small, uh, small ratio, for example, they have decided uh, that they will go for one piece of work, one construction or something like a hockey, uh, some some works, and then there is a massive mobilization against this um, project. Don't you listen to those because they flood you with claims and with complaints, etc. So this is just a reflection. But what would you do in that case? We know participating participatory processes. I can say that I have participated from the other side of participatory processes uh, with um, political ideologies that were for the participation. Maybe yours is not so in, so much in favor of participation, but Madrid is an example of participatory processes despite ideologies. And then you go to a participatory process with a participatory budget and you present this to the participation uh, councillor or the mayor and they say, oh no, it's not participatory. So from the point of view of the politician, not from the point of view of the citizenship. And um, therefore, <coughs> Um, this is exactly the same as uh, when, uh, well, I don't see this logical because it would be more logical for me to have one uh, decision against the, pro the project uh, by one citizen. But I think uh, this is exactly how I uh, understood it. And some years ago, I gave this example to a socialist mayor, woman, who was always uh, speaking about the participatory process, but I asked her, well, if we as citizens decide that in the uh, main square you're going to build a statue by Franco, are you going to endow the money for this statue? I think it has to do a lot with communication. We need to see how to reach everybody from the beginning to end the re results report, the follow up of the actions where they have participated so as to not to frustrate people. I think this has to do with this intention of uh, reaching as many people as possible with all the mechanisms. There is one question here about influencers. Okay, as we have uh, cut the thread of this uh, presentation, I don't know if you want to give uh, the floor to Nicole Markwick because she's asking. Yeah. yeah, she was raising her hand. Hello, I come from Valmarcos. I have to say that the sound is very, very bad, a lot of ups and downs. There are two questions in the chat. 
where I would like to delve upon, particularly the tools that you are using to send SMEs messages and to understand the flow. And the how do you deal with data protection policies and data by citizens? Um, it is very important to see um, how we can enter digital data. I would like to understand what is the process to enter data. And if you could share more information on SMEs. I cannot hear you well, Nicole. I think that what she was asking is the type of tools used, taking into account that the uh, taking into account the flows, the citizen flows, uh, data flows, whether you uh, have uh, any automatic process or you need a team of people to work on this. And, they, and she was asking also regarding the tools. Uh, when you send SMEs, uh, what are the tools that you are using? Thank you. Well, this is uh, the same as the list they were saying in all processes, we work with registration forms. In all uh, neighbors uh, meetings, we take all those data to neighbors. It is uh, like our um, hallmark, not just us as direction because directorate, because we're 70 people working in the directorate, but at the government level uh, in the city of Buenos Aires and the municipality, we try to invite all these neighbors and we try to identify uh, what are the topics they are most interested in? And of course, we try to take that data and all the neighbors that come accept uh, our use of the data and they accept the fact that we can use those data to invite them to further activities. Our directorate is not the one who deals with this database work, but there are all their areas of the government that deal with these um, data, but we um, share them and we work together so as to be able to bring them closer to those neighbors that have expressed their interest for specific topics. This is the way we work. We work with different segments um, and different audiences as well. But we work with trial and error. I mean, we were uh, correcting um, as we grew as a directorate so as to understand better our participatory neighbors. I mean, this is very useful for us and is the way we work. So today, what depends on the Buenos Aires government uh, after 12 years of, of work of uh, participation in closeness? But if I go back to 12 years ago, we didn't have any databases or anything like that. So we started just with the neighbours. Well, we say that we want a, a government that is close to the people a government that is close to the people and then we can have the different um, meetings uh, in the different uh, neighborhoods uh, to see the territories uh, and there were 20 people uh, where they would uh, knock on the door talk to the person and our chief of, of government was in this district so that's the way it was done back then People would ask them about uh, their interest, for example, if it was about the neighborhood itself, about uh, the park, and then the work evolved after 12 years of work. 12 years of communicating 
and about interests of, uh, of the office. And I can assure you that during these 12 years, uh, this neighborhood district, there were 20 people, 30 people. So this uh, work was evolving. And now we can say that we have a good databases uh, with lots of information. And what it's also binding to answer to Miguel, that for us, it is indeed binding. Because we did stop something, say, okay, because this is what people are, are telling us. Let's listen to them. That's what they want in their square meter. Because the decisions are very technical, but sometimes uh, technicians in their daily lives uh, are, are not in the daily lives of, of the neighbors. So they don't really see the difficulties they may encounter. So sometimes we've stopped the works we were doing and have a different proposal where we can reach a consensus. There are some things that had a big impact. Uh, there was one in Buenos Aires and it had a very negative impact. So it wasn't carried out in the end. It was for a Metro bus. Uh, but nowadays, everyone is happy with this metro bus because it saves time for the people who uh, commute to work, uh, but also to many other people. So sometimes it's uh, the decision of listening, thinking, and think about all the government uh, political decisions. And then with time, they start to accept that the decision was actually a good one. So it is binding. I think we answered everything. Thank you very much. Um, some other questions that I see, for example, Marta, uh, colleague from Madrid's uh, council, she said that it's curious that, um, well, you mentioned that you had influences for your communication campaigns. And she said that even if with with the influencers help, uh, you couldn't get to the uh, youngsters. So what other tools do you use to actually get to them? But uh, influencers, uh, well, it's something we've been doing for a couple of years now. And uh, I'm going to do like a comparison between comparison uh, between uh, Argentina and uh, Buenos Aires. So we've got our president in Argentina, the one that really caught the young population attention with his campaign, with his way of speaking. With his explanation about the projects for the future, that it is really impressive. But not did he not only get this, but also for, for Argentina, for us who work there, it, it was actually quite uh, quite shocking. And then when we talk about Buenos Aires, then we realize that uh, people who are 16 years old, who could be part of the participation, who could be interested, um, but then they're not. It's difficult for us to get them interested. Uh, so it is a challenge for us, but we also understand that uh, the youngsters from 16 years old on, so in their mind, they have uh, this idea of freedom, this mentality of being free. So we're in a city where we want to find, to organize, coordinate, improve things. And so everything like putting boxes, let's say, then that's why they're not interested. Unless the mom is saying, okay, this is going to be modified for you. If it, this is not the case, it's very difficult to, to have a, a young person on board. Some things uh, where we actually have the youngs on board uh, is, uh, for example, in, in environmental topics because this is very interesting for them. The pets as well, they're very interested. They want to participate in everything that's related to, to pets, but uh, 
when we speak about other topics, not really, they're not interested. So we try to work with the, the influencers for this. And we're trying to think of, of the, the opportunity to widen it to, in within the the networks, the social media, and apps. So there are lots of things to see how we can make an approach for the youngsters as well. But again, not not politically, but just uh, in the decision making process where we want to have the young population on board. So, for example, the the state park. So the skate park will be for people who are 16 years old and not people who are older than 30. So we are trying to see all this methodology, but it is true, it is still a challenge. So Carolina Linares answered another question. She had another question, sorry. I'm Carolina Linares. I'm from the Planification Institute of Lima. I've been listening to you. It's the first time that I am participating in this group and I find it very, very interesting. So we're in two participative processes that are actually very complex. So one is the development plan of the north of Lima. So it's, it's a development for the city. And this is where we need to speak about the new unifications for this part of the city. That's one of the things. And then we have another one that's actually quite important, that is the Metropolitan Development Plan of Callao, where we have uh, an agreement with Lima as well, because the governance works slightly different. So what we have is an agreement, and we're within our participation process to uh, approve this plan. I'm building up this plan for, uh, for it to be approved. It wasn't approved uh, two years ago. Uh, the government, the previous government didn't approve it. And this government signed an agreement with us because our competence in, in Lima is a metropolitan area, not in Callao. So having both processes uh, parallel and all of them having different uh, particularities, then Tools are quite similar to be applied, I think, but the groups are different. So if I think about El Kaya, which is the one we are moving forward on right now, then I wanted to ask you, how do you tackle the topic of activists? Maybe you spoke about that before, but here, for example, we have activists who have a very fair courses, who contribute to a better city, better sustainable development, etc. But there are also some activists with, uh, with their own agenda and with uh, personal topics. So how within the participative processes that you've been tackling, so what methodology do you use in this particular case? Because we have it within a map, uh, in a mapping of uh, stakeholders, but how's the operating part? This this would be my question. Thank you very much. What I can say and how we work, it, well, it's happened to us as well, and we've got activists, and we work in as if. Uh, and because obviously we also have the political parties, etc. Oh, there was just they just want to go against it, just for the sake of it, really. Sometimes, but um, when we've got projects like the ones you mentioned, we need to think about the general general objective and how it can be carried out. So when we have these type of things, they're the very first ones who want to say something about it, to go against it. So what we do is we start to segment these people. So we meet them, 
sometimes with all the neighbors as well and we want to understand what they're doing what are they telling us so we're segmented by this group we listen to them and we need to see if this group is more than 30 people or not if not we do it uh, if if it is we do several meeting of 10 people so we get the dialogue log started and we listen to they want to what they want so sometimes the process has uh, some ways of negotiating or some things that you can actually negotiate about for example Angie was speaking about Costa BA. And in Costa BA, we had no neighbors living around. But they had a lot of people, wholesalers, retailers who worked nearby. So they had to commit. So this uh, retailers, we had to work with them to represent BA Costa, to tell them what we were going to do there and what the benefits were or what was actually needed to keep on working not just during the works but afterwards as well which was which is what was going to be benefiting from them they were retailers who had uh, i mean they, they weren't young people but the a costa was was for them for children from youngsters it was different for different characteristics so for the people who are going to consume something in this place so it would be much more expensive uh, that what a youngster would uh, consume so they had to see that as well and see how they could reinvent the, themselves within buenos aires but what i mean is that sometimes you have to segment the work within parts and see what the problem really are and then from that point on think about the rest of the things if you get everyone the activists then it's just a contact at the end and then you'll never actually get to a solution sorry the know those this was very long and difficult but uh, that's what we have to do uh, sorry i'm 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 being a bit bubbly right now, but I hope it was clear for you. Yes, indeed, it, it was clear. We have some groups that uh, we had to separate uh, and create a specific meeting with them because uh, they stopped uh, at the door of the municipality. Uh, but um, it was actually interesting. And this uh, activist group, it was actually a group of neighbors with a specific agenda but it's also happened with us with uh, other activists that have their own agenda so i think that separate them and segment them could help solve uh, these uh, principal problems and then to contribute in a positive way so yes, I did understand. Thank you very much, Celeste. Well, Carolina, I think here it is very important what uh, Miguel said at the beginning about uh, listening. He was stating the example about uh, even having more information about uh, the activists, even more than what them they themselves have. So you can kind of break down their arguments uh, in mostly in those groups who have their own agenda because it is just uh, manipulative. So this is what we saw as well in the processes, participation processes, as we can have this, uh, this virtuation process because there is this manipulation that is internal from the administration as well as the manipulation coming from the leadership roles. Marta, perdona. Creo que no se te oye bien. Marta, you're breaking up, sorry. You're breaking up, sorry. We can't listen to you, Marta. 
No sé si ahora. No da igual. Es que no, no, debes, no debo tener buena conexión. Sorry, I don't think my connection is very good, but that's all I wanted to say. Okay, now one more question about uh, participation of children and youngsters. So there is someone asking, how do you manage uh, communication with the children and from what uh, age on do you work with them? Have you, have you managed that communication? That's also challenging. Uh, but what we do is that we invite parents to participate in those activities. For example, now we have the winter holidays here in Buenos Aires. And what we want to have is these experiences. We, we just want them to participate in these activities with their children in Buenos Aires. So we just invite parents because from 18 years old is when we invite people. In Buenos Aires, they can come voluntarily 16 from 16 years old, yeah. But then when they're 18 is when they are of legal age. And this is the people who we invite from them when they are 18 and the ones that are under 18, we invite parents. And we invite them in the winter holidays, but sometimes the winter holidays are not holidays for everybody, but we try to invite them so they can be with us for a while. Yeah, so what's, what Angie was saying is that uh, when we tackle those children actions, We've got an example. So, how do how do dogs work with the police? So this is the same thing. When we work with pets. Well, the children, the youngsters, will always like this uh, pet um, idea. So if you put it together with another idea, then we'll you'll get their interest to know what's happening, how a dog can help the police, and then you tell the mother, the father, even the uncle or the aunt. So they can go together with the child to the activity and see what they're doing. For example, in this case, the police, what they're doing, where it is, the facilities. So every master that you see there, you're not just telling the child, you're also telling the parent. So you've got both participations, the child's and the parents, because it's the same as when we speak about recycling. You invite them to a recycling center, uh, center so they can see it, and they see lots of processes of what's happening there, and they kind of incorporate that division, and you can see all the work that's behind it. And both of them see it, the child and the parent. So it's easier actually to get to the child than to get to their parent. And they'll tell them that the child will say, for example, at home, oh, mom, you have to recycle this. So this is also important. And this is uh, the way of showing how we want to work with the neighbors. So it's uh, little by little, go to activities. Uh, not just for the parent, but for the child to incorporate different uh, uh, policies. Thank you very much. Celeste and Angie, we were interrupting you a lot, but we didn't have much time. So I don't know if there's something that uh, you would like to say, if you've got any conclusions, any reflections before we close the workshop, because it was so interesting and we interrupted you so much. Uh, so now the floor is you. If you want to wrap up about your presentation to see what you would like to do. We're happy to answer everything. <laughs> well, the last thing that we wanted to mention, one of the uh, questions that someone had, uh, it, for example, saying that uh, 1,500 people uh, came, but uh, 
we're speaking about it. So if we go back to the concept that we work here in Buenos Aires, is how many people really know about what we're doing? And that's the, what the citizen participation is about, to give the opportunity to all the neighbors to participate if they want to do so. But because we have targets, uh, of course, for the different activities, but we want people to participate with different uh, tools, uh, social media, with uh, our team in the streets. So they can have this objective. But you can imagine it's like iceberg. It's like a triangle. And there's a foundation of the targeted population, but they need to know about the activities that we're doing as a government. And we want them to participate and you can have, for example, 50,000 people that is not representative uh, with the uh, 3 million people that we have living here, but maybe in um, specifically located places. Um, then we want to try that and we want to get to them in and they have different scopes. And of course, out of those 50,000, the people who then sign up is lower from those 50,000. We may have 3,000 people who will sign up to it and the ones that will actually participate uh, could be uh, uh, 500 people. So this is the iceberg I was speaking about. So it is repetitive, but we want to give everyone the possibility to participate in this activity that's interesting for them. Because when we have a project, well, the first thing that we think about is who's this, uh, who's going to be interested in this, uh, who is our target uh, up for this um, project. We need to get to know the pro the project, the audience, uh, so we can have more people to participate. Uh, but first, they need to find out, they need to know about it, and then, and the activities. How this activity was created, and then have a conclusion of the project to to kind of revalidate the activity that we are already doing. And just to conclude our presentation, we support that uh, we stand by the fact that the way in which you communicate is fundamental. That is not the same for everyone we learned throughout the years how we did this in Buenos Aires to try to understand the neighbors, the interests, and the government for what they have. So what we offer is actually attractive and uh, the ideas and the projects are actually interesting and they must know that what they say we we bear it in mind so the conclusion is actually collective it belongs to everyone so this is what we want to do celeste do you want to add anything else I just wanted to say something very little regarding what uh, Carolina was saying is that the, every the, the process kind of be more rewarding uh, unless you have uh, your adversaries like those if you actually get something and I think the formulas that are not secret is what Marta was saying is to reset with more secret then let them speak listen to them do something make them participate of the solutions up, up to a certain extent, of course, and then if you can't actually have them participate, then explain why. But I think that's the secret formula of all the participative, participative processes, because having these uh, participation processes with people who, who are just going to say yes to everything, they agree to everything you say, well, that's, that's not very much rewarding, is it? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to conclude the workshop, and I think, uh, Miguel, your summary is, is very much it, because uh, these are things that uh, 
Well, we all think about uh, the professionals that we have here are professionals in participation, but I think that uh, uh, we all repeat ourselves these things, but even if we repeat them, they're still hard to, to achieve. As you were saying, to to make the your enemy become your ally, how we can do this. Uh, and there's something different, that the participation has a limit. Um, if you are within that limit, there is not, impossible is nothing. Because once you have uh, that, it's very difficult to make them change their opinion. Yes, in all the institutions that we hear, they're in the participatory group because they want to improve the participation. And sometimes we are honest, but sometimes you say, I can't do anything else. That's it. This is my limit. Yes, yeah, so it is absurd to keep pushing the wall if the wall is not going to move. Before saying goodbye, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone who's sp spoken. Thank you to everyone who's asked the questions. And then we'll have the last workshop where we'll be speaking about uh, digital um, online presentation. In two weeks' time, 26th uh, uh, June, we will send you the call. We hope it is interesting for you. And again, thank you very much, uh, everyone who is here and who is interested in devoting some time of your morning or of your afternoons, uh, because we do this because we're very excited. And again, thank you very much um, to the We Saw Lots of Interest, We Saw Debates, and thank you very much. Uh, Marta, Susana, is there anything else you'd like to say? Once again, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll have the next workshop on the 26th, but we may have an extraordinary one in July in which we'll have Maria Caldas, who has been here today for some time, who's an expert in participation in the whole process of Belo Horizonte, which is one of the origins of. Uh, their public participation. So we've got her as visiting researcher of uh, the chair that I direct. So we want to squeeze all her knowledge. So we don't know if it's going to be a seminar, a workshop, a round table, but we will want you, uh, we will want to all of you to be there. So again, thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you everyone in Buenos Aires. Uh, this was a very fruitful, and we're looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day.